fan of the perfume industry, pretty much the citrus industry, and some essential oils from Italy. And uh, to begin, some of the, we're gonna, and we're going to smell some of these things too, which is better than hearing just words. So, and you know, you're all familiar with lemon, lime, tangerine, grapefruit, some mandarin, yes? How many people are familiar with bergamot? Well, there's a few, see? There's a true Sicilians. <laughs> well, there's only, there's only really one place in the world that really this is grown and cultivated. That's in Calabria, just across the Straits of Messina, the Toll of Italy. Very small region of, uh, of the world. So, if we can, let me see what can we turn down the lights so we can see what's first slide? The lights that are there. Which light would you like to see? Well, so they can see the screen. The, the, the front floodlights. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And the flag. Uh, and you your first slide. <coughs> so these are for just to run briefly, so you don't have to remember all this. These orange, briefly, tangerine, mandarin, lemon lime. These are all, these, this section right here, all the same component. Very large percentage. A lot of similarity between the citrus. It's all the trace components that makes the difference. And bergamot, look, bergamot makes a big change. And that's what's very unusual. So we're going to look at some of the uh, some of the things from And you can give me the next slide. That's my lovely assistant, my wife. So the first thing you're going to look at, where do you get these oils? How do they get the essenza? from these fruits. Well, they not only come from the fruits, it comes from fruits, leaves, twigs, bark, roots, everything we, we do in botanical, we extract out for flavor and fragrance material. So you see, from one tree, from one tree we have the fruit, the blossoms, and the leaves and twigs. Now, under each, under the fruit, from the fruit, we get a processed extract, we get peel from marmalade, from bitter orange. And then what we extract further is the juice from bread. It comes in two layers, oil layer and water layer. The water is on the bottom, the oil is on the top. For the blossoms, the same thing. You dissolve an extract, you just the orange flower. This is the, this is the essence from the flower with all its waxes. And the steam distilled version, which is they run the flowers with steam. And that separates also the two layers. Oil on top, water on the bottom, and culinary oil, or orange blossom oil. And absolute is after they remove the waxes, this is the other type of essence that comes from the same flower. Also, during the steam distillation, there's two layers, an oil phase and a water phase, and that's orange flower water. You've heard of rose water, too. This is orange flower water. An orange flower water, some of you know this is used in cooking too. You know, yes? Mm -hmm. And the uh, 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 some people use the orange flower water. And then again, a further extraction of the water gives the orange flower absolute. From the leaves and twigs, there's two types of extractions, steam distilled and alcohol. This is called petigram or small grains. How, how this name came originally, the tree from which the fruit and blossoms were growing, the, some of the immature fruits used to fall to the ground. So they picked up these small grains and they made a little extract that's called petigram. Now the industry's changed enough to where they take the leaves and the twigs and they steam distill the leaves and twigs and get a material that's really, if you think of it, it's orange leaf. It's true for orange leaf, lemon leaf, bergamot leaf, mandarin leaf. All the citrus leaves have some product that they call generically pedigree or pedigree. So, uh, it's a lot from one tree. Gives so many products. Give me, give me the next slide if you like. And these are some of the materials that come and from all these different products. They're all in common, but they're all in different proportions. They have citrus notes, floral notes, fruity notes, spicy notes, and some green, earthy, leafy notes. Now, the first thing we're gonna smell 
because the business of talking about flavors of fragrance doesn't count until you can smell it. Now what we're going to do is I'm going to, my lovely assistant's going to hand some blotters per row down and we'll hand down this row and you pass the blotters along to smell and uh, Thank you. 
much to the disappointment of the uh, Italian government and uh, grow it, but they were never able to produce the same quality until very recently. Now it's fairly good. Not as good as the original Italian Calabria material, but now, where did this come from? Nobody knows. They, they say they know. Some, it was originally thought that this was brought by Christopher Columbus, who's into everything, from the town of Burgo near Barcelona, Spain. But this is, but nobody's really sure because they, some people insist, as only the Italians could, that this is a special hybrid unique only to Calabria. <laughs> so so, so we, we always have, whenever I say it's from Burgo, Barcelona, I always throw that in to make sure everybody knows. Now we're going to smell that. Now, and we'll talk about how unusual this is and why it's unusual. Essenza, Burgo. And there's a few things made from this, but not, not much. They tell me that the juice is not used for anything. When I go there and visit, I, I did find what the juice is used for. They take, because there's so little produced, they take it and they add some of it to grapefruit to make it much brighter and more palatable. Because some people don't like grapefruit, it's a little bitter for them. But this makes it much more citrusy and bright. It's a fruit. We, you know, probably. I don't have a slot to add, but I did bring a picture of it. I think so. <laughs> Makes you pucker up. This is, you can see it, this is the, it looks like about, about the size of the orange, green and yellow. And they, they, they never quite turn all yellow. Much more than citrus. So that 
has uh, prevented people from making uh, too much demand on it because it's, it's too perfuming. They, they describe it as too perfuming. I happen to love it. I, when I'm there, I take the bergamot, squeeze it right into the water, and drink it. It's a delightful, refreshing drink. You can go to the next slide. Now, these in, per, in uh, perfume industry, these are the top sellers for 1999. See all these? Every one of these fragrances, the CK1, Eternity Men, now everything I'm telling you now, this is trade secret information. You don't, you'll never hear this from anybody else. Because they don't know, and, and typically, they, they don't tell or publish any, uh, any of this information. So, but every one of these fragrances, CK1, Eternity Men, Polo Sport, Tommy, Cool Water, Hugo, all of the Woody Blends, Polo, Obsession, Floral Blends, Pleasures, Eternity, all of these have some bergamot to a greater or lesser degree. So this is, uh, you see the CK1, Bergamot Lemon. They have all used lemon mandarin, all citrus, Italian citrus oils. And typically, it's recognized in the industry that the Italians make the best quality oils of anyone. And this is, uh, this is they demand the highest price. Uh, they're cherished for fine perfumes and colognes. Uh, this was, uh, and they've been used since 1700s uh, and documented since 1700s. Now you can be sure, like everything else in life, what's written is only written after it's many hundreds or thousands of years of use. Uh, people didn't have the presence or the desire to write down everything they did. Uh, so anything that's laced with a date, you can assume hundreds or thousands of years before it was used. Uh, perfume started as early written records as the ancient Egyptians, Greeks, and Romans. And the Romans uh, did the best in organizing everything and dispensing it through the world. Um, one more slide, I believe. Uh, and, and, see, and these are some of the women's fragrances. Chanel 5, Arpe, Chanel de Bois. Uh, that the one that's not on here, that's conspicuously absent, is, uh, look how, since 1921 to 1997, it, it's a continuing theme. It's little changes are made all the time, but they always incorporate the use of bergamot, lime, mandarin. So it's a, it's a, it's a fabulous uh, component that add lift and brightness to almost every uh, flavor or fragrance. And now is going to save time for, at this point, ask any questions you may have. Go ahead. Why is it that the Chanel uh, number five, which is six in front, doesn't smell anything like the Chanel number five in the middle of Oh, that's a, that's a very good no, question. No, Most people don't know that. No, no, that no, that's no, correct. Because I always have my sense in front. Well, well there's, two, there's two reasons for it. You know, that Chanel became the big corporate conglomerate. They have two different production centers. They use different quality materials. Even though the formulation is the same, they have, here's what happens in, in reality. You would say, well, why do they use the same quality? Because it's not available in enough quantity. That's why. And we have different laws and regulations in the United States than we have in Europe. And Europe is allowed to use things that we don't use here. We are overly cautious from a toxicological and safety standpoint here in the United States. Uh, even though we had thousands, of, well, we had, in this country, we had hundreds of years of safe use, they don't care. Once they find something, there's a little problem. For example, in Bergamot, uh, in 1980s, or 70s, 80s, thereabouts, they found that Bergamot can cause a photosensitization. What that means is that when sunlight hits the the chemical on your skin, it can cause irritation. It causes irritation in about 1% of the people. So it has to be less, in the United States, the regulations has to be less than 1%. So, so because, you know, we're so litigious, you know, we sue everybody for everything, and the juries award them a lot of money, and you spill hot coffee and you get three million bucks. So, so this is, uh, so we've become so litigious that we're air on the side of safety. So that's one of the reasons. The other reason is that some of the materials are produced in such small quantity that they have a replacement for this 
material used in the United States. No, not the aldehyde. See, now you, well, you, you seem like you know something about fragrance. Well, aldehydes are a particular class of chemical. The reason that uh, they say this is aldehydic floral, and they say this is aldehydes, people say this without knowing what they're talking about or knowing anything about it whatsoever. Aldehydes occur naturally in every single product, every single botanical that's ever extracted, aldehydes occur naturally. What happened with Chanel number five is during what Chanel number five in 1921, synthetic chemistry was just able to synthesize aldehydes for the first time. So since they were available synthetically for the first time, they could add more than nature could add. So instead of existing at 0.1%, they put them at 0.3%. So it's three times more than was in nature, and it made the fragrance much stronger and brighter. So this is, they call aldehyde chloral without really understanding. It's just that it's almost, it's become, in my view, a silly marketing term. See, so to understand it from a chemical standpoint, though, how it relates to nature is a much more interesting story. But, but sales girls and marketers don't want to tell anybody this <laughs> because they don't know it themselves. Yes? Why is it that, uh, what happens chemically when the same fragrance will smell differently on different well, people always say that. You don't think that's true? Well, it's not completely true. It's true to a very minor extent. And the reason it's true, here's why that you perceive it this way. First of all, when you put something on yourself, uh, your perception of what is on you is different from what someone else's perception. There's also a function of time, your body temperature, how long it's been on your skin. This, the fragrances are dynamic, changing. So from moment to moment, they are different. Not, Forget about from person to person. I'll give you the reverse. Why is it that I can recognize the fragrance on anybody I smell it on? That's because I recognize the identity. You're looking at a very narrow snapshot of time. So that's another little bit of a myth. There are some people whose body chemistry causes, we have odor on our own you know, as well. So our skin uh, uh, emanates a particular odor or how many thousands of chemicals. Mm -hmm. So though your own particular body odor is mixing with this, so, so it would smell different to that extent, but the fragrance itself is not really smelling different. What you're smelling is the difference in time, concentration, your body temperature, and what, it's like a passing train where each car looks a little different as it goes on. And when, when you're looking, you're seeing a different color. But the train is still the same. And there are times that when a woman is wearing a particular fragrance, and it um, turns me off. I don't like it. I don't like it. That I can't talk about. <laughs> 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 it's like something natural to it. Well, again, that may, be her, that may be her own body chemistry that is it, it, it is not a great combination with that fragrance. So that's the next thing. Yes? Are these the only ingredients? No. No. We, it, it, they are some of the ingredients that are used. If you notice, I only looked at the citruses. Oh, yes. So, since fragrances have thousands of ingredients, I just focused on what citruses are used. And I also can tell you how much is used. <laughs> yes? What is the difference between the oils used in aromatherapy, they call essential oils, and the oils used in perfume? There's no difference. The, uh, the, the, the soy oils that are used in it, the question is what's the difference in the oils used in aromatherapy or the oils used in perfumes? And, and the answer is there is no difference. The, 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 the question might have been phrased this way. Is there a difference between aromatherapy oils and perfumes? And the answer is yes. In general, aromatherapy oils only contain botanical extract. It's not always true, but they say that's what they claim. And in perfume, it's synthetic materials, albeit nature identical, are used with essential oils. It's a combination of both. So that's that might clear up your question. Yes? <clears throat> um, with some of these oils, could you cook with them, or do you need like food-grade versions of them? Uh, well, most, most, everything you see here is food-grade. Everything you smell today is food-grade. You could cook with them. You, and they, and they are, in fact, used in, in baking and confection and, and uh, other kinds of uh, cooking applications. But, the, but there are some natural oils that are 
completely natural that are not used to cook because they're not allowed by the Food and Drug Administration. For example, absinthe. Absinthe is no longer used, but that was used at one time. Uh, oil of sassafras for root beer was eliminated, although erroneously eliminated, it's been eliminated today. It is erroneously eliminated, but it was eliminated nonetheless because they, they thought that sackle, the major component of root beer, was a carcinogen. Now, it turned out to be carcinogen, but only for mice, not for people. So, because it, it, was, only, uh, it was only 30 years, or, or actually 60 years later, that they found out that saffron in a mouse has a different metabolic pathway than it does in humans. So, and so, but once it's eliminated, you can't get something back on. It takes, a, it takes more than an act of Congress, so. Yes? I'm more related to the olfactory system. Why is it that after a while you smell something that seems like it doesn't smell anymore? That's a good question. Okay. Everybody kind of hear the question? Yeah. Well, this is what's known as an olfactory loop. It's like listening to a, a sound for long enough. Your brain ignores the signal. So you can, you can s smell. First, if you smell long enough, your brain acclimates. So that means that you're, it's a way of survival. You're safe in that environment. If, you, if there's an increase in concentration, you will smell the increase, but you won't smell a decrease in concentration until you have been in that decreased concentration for more than 10 minutes. Okay, so there's nothing you can do but just... No, that's, a, that's one Stop of the... Stop smelling for 10 minutes. Correct. That's why I tell you, sniff it lightly. Don't inhale it so profusely. It's, it, it's the sniff lightly and breathe. Yes? Sure, sure. That's 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 uh, partly responsible for that business. You know, it's a, <laughs> it's a, so. Can you repeat the question? Course, and I'll give the example. Excuse me. What was the question? The question is, can I comment on the thriving business of knockoffs? Now, what that means is knockoff means uh, it's opium puts out a fragrance, somebody else puts out another fragrance, and makes. If you like opium, you'll love this. You love poppy for example. <laughs> That's a true story. <laughs> so, uh, obviously, the company that put out opium is not going to go knock themselves off. It's another company who, want, who recognizes that the market exists for this type of fragrance. It's well received. So they put out a lower cost version of this. In almost every case, People who, who come to me and said, you know, I like opium, can you make a fragrance like that? And I say, sure. And I make it, I do a faithful replication, and I extract it and analyze it and put together a very good rendition of it. And I tell them the price is $60 a pound. They say, no, we don't want that. We want a version for $15 a pound. You see? So, so this is, while it's possible that you can get knockoffs that are of the same quality, it's extremely rare because generally the people who are doing it want to make a very low cost version mm -hmm. so they get a shadow of it. Mm -hmm. Yes? I love drinking green tea and I'm wondering is it just a coincidence that it smells so much like this, the bergamot? Uh, I, I it's, it, it doesn't smell like it to me. Oh, okay. The, so now I'm wondering, do you drink Earl Grey tea? No, I use the salada. Okay, uh, do you ever drink Earl Grey tea? No. No, no. okay. Is it, is it, now, see, and I'm very careful to tell people that are wrong in this, because I'll tell you why. In green tea, there are some common components, so sometimes you'll latch onto a characteristic that exists in natural bergamot that you're associating with green tea. It's not, it's not what I call it an accurate characterization, but I'll give the example. When you look at a forest, you could spot the yellow leaf. But you're missing the green of the forest. <laughs> but you're right, there is a yellow leaf there. And that's similar to what you're doing with Bergamot. You're spotting the yellow leaf in the green forest. And so it's not wrong, it's just not 100% correct. <laughs> From a professional standpoint. Okay. From an artistic standpoint, you can do whatever you want. <laughs> Any other questions? Do people pack in Ah, no. Why do you, did anybody, can anybody know anything about the patent process? And, they don't want to know what's in it. Correct. Mm -hmm. If you patent the perfume, you, you have to disclose it. If you disclose it, people could change one ingredient and say have something no. So it's much more powerful to protect as a trade secret and keep those 200 components trade secret without giving away the whole formulation. And it's very few people. And 
that. And I'm, I'm one of probably less than 30 people in the United States who has that ability, both analytically and olfactorily. So it's a combination of those two things you need, not just one or the other. Yes? Pardon me? I work for my own company. It's called Custom Messenger in Somerset, New Jersey. Now, there is no, that's, that's not, uh, there is no one common ingredient in perfume. There is a collection of common ingredients. And those collection of common ingredients include all the citrus products, all of them, lemon, lime, tangerine, mandarin, grapefruit, bergamot, uh, and all the flower oils, rose, jasmine, orange flower, uh, all the precious wood extracts, cedarwood, sandalwood, uh, veteran roots. These are, these are a collection of ingredients that are used over and over. And so there's no one common ingredient. It's a collection of about 200, really, ingredients that are, that form 90% of all perfumes. But in our repertoire, we have over 6,000 materials that we use that create all the different combination, combinations and permutations. There's only 12 notes in the musical scale. How many songs do you make out of those? So and we have five or 6,000 ingredients that we use for perfumes and flavors. So we, all those combinations. Yes. Um, these these are oils, like the bergamot and all that. They're oils, and it seems like the perfume is not like oily. You know what I mean? So how do you combine like the alcohol or or water, or whatever, it's with the very, oils? It, it, it's very simply a dilution of the concentrated oil in alcohol. Alcohol has to, is a medium by which the perfume is distributed and dispersed. Uh, so otherwise, they'd be very viscous. In, in this country, it's, uh, you couldn't sell just concentrated oils without a warning that it's irritating the skin and eyes. Do you have your own perfume that you've developed? No. And the reason I don't have my own perfume that I developed is that as a commercial artist working for companies, if I did, I'd be a direct competitor of my customers. Okay. Okay. Yes. Another scent scenario? Nearly. Nearly. Yeah. Nearly. Do you have any of that? No. That, that's, that, but it, that, it's the same as the orange blossom oil that I gave you. Nearly and orange blossom oil are very similar. They're two different qualities. Yes? When has not come into the picture? Somebody always asks this question about musk. What is the question? Excuse me, where does musk come from or where does musk come from in the fragrance? <laughs> musk was a generic term that was used to characterize the odor uh, left by animals on trees or, or mating when they, as part of their scent marking, when they mark a territory or mark, uh, 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 use it in spray or either or, or for mating. This term musk <coughs> comes from that, that it was a generic term ascribed to something that was extremely long-lasting uh, and had a, created a foundation for perfumes. So many materials are said to have a musk-like character. So these perfumes were thought to be, these materials were thought to be uh, attractants to some degree, sexually. So this is something that has never been proven but people are still working on this, looking for that pheromone or that musk attractant. But it's, yes, Lily? Um, I feel it's, I think I just got an answer to my question a few back. When I drink sherry, I like to drink it straight up. And I take a little twist of lemon and slightly singe it over a candle and twist it just a little and drop it into the sherry. And I never understood why it was so beautifully dispersed until you said alcohol. It, it, it just, done that. It, it, yeah, the alcohol. It, 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 first of all, when you mix anything with any kind of drink, the components that are soluble are going to be dispersed out through the liquid medium. And, and, and sherry, which has can have 10 to 20 percent alcohol, is going to distribute that flavor component mm -hmm. from that citrus rind, which is in direct contrast to the type of 
components that are in the sherry already, which are all aged, uh, kind of floral and whiny yeah. and fruity. Yeah. Citrus is very bright and lively, yeah. so that's going to be picked up. You, you've changed the balance and blend. These guys worked so hard 20 years to get with the sherry <laughs> and created a lemon. So that's a lemon twist. Well, this is, this is what people do. That's what everybody's so creative, you know. The combination is dynamite. Yes. Yes. Um, speaking of most, does any perfume manufacturer put the pheromones or pheromones? People say they do. Uh, there have been a few. Joe Van has done this uh, originally, initially, and that has come from um, the sweat of boar. And they have they have extracted this in drostenone, which is which they has been uh, somewhat identified as a sexual attractant. And never it's for been works for pigs, but for men. Uh, but they but they put it in nonetheless. So and you can pay for it. <laughs> They're very careful. <laughs> Well, I, I think we should conclude, and I have, a, a, as a little surprise to you, I grew up a, a, a little sample for everybody of a men's clone and women's perfume, and they're not knockoffs, but they're in the family of Chanel 19 and Paco Rabanne. And they're not labeled, because we don't make retail sales, but they are very good quality perfumes, I'm sure you like them.